Now, in many European countries, the idea of genetically modified food isn't as abhorrent as, say, euthanasia. Now, India's ongoing crisis of farmer suicides has also been blamed on the increased use of Monsanto's GM crops and the resulting debt that those farmers suffer. In Nepal, massive protests broke out after notorious Monsanto forced its seeds onto the country's farmers. And it's not just Monsanto. In Taiwan, a country that has a vested political interest and friendly ties with the U.S., the mere mention of a U.S. beef additive called ractopamine is enough to send thousands of farmers to the streets in violent protest of our products. But what about here at home? Why aren't we outraged about what we eat? Do we even know what we eat? Do we know that what's in our food what's in our seeds, and what we're buying on the food shelves. Well, here with me to discuss this issue is uh, Christopher Cook. He is the author of the book, Diet for a Dead Planet. Christopher, uh, thank you so much for taking the time Thanks. to speak with us. Uh, uh, it's such a broad issue that it, it's sort of difficult to figure out where to begin. But, but let's look at this divide between, I guess, the rest of the world and, and, and U.S. consumers here at home. Uh, am I mistaken in, in having the impression that we're just not as up in arms over GMOs as, as Europeans, for example, are? Well, I think actually the movement uh, against GMOs in general and also for labeling in the U.S. is actually quite uh, active and vibrant and that you'll see uh, comments posted to USDA to the government uh, in the millions. Uh, there's actually very widespread concern uh, across the U.S. about the spread of genetically modified foods. For instance, um, about 80 different cities across the country have tried or towns have tried to uh, ban GMOs within their locality. And the state of Vermont uh, had a ban on GMOs. And, you know, they continue, the corporations continue to, to battle this, these in court. But, you know, the, the reality is that what people are up against is a, a large political system in Congress and the presidency of either party that is uh, very closely tied to the agribusiness complex, which includes Monsanto and other big companies like uh, Syngenta and um, DuPont and other big corporations that, that control most of our seeds. And so it's very difficult to get um, people on the federal level and the national level to pay attention, but there's actually very widespread concern across the U.S. about this issue. You know, it, it, there may be growing concern about the issue, but the problem with uh, the U.S. is that this is something that's already in place that we're fighting to overturn. So I'm curious about the, the divide. How is it that this country uh, sort of uh, saw such ease for, for Monsanto and similar type companies to sort of spread and, and operate the way they do, whereas uh, other countries have been able to block them? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, since GMO products, GMO seeds began to roll out in about 1996. Um, they really just took over like wildfire. And the the government, the United States Department of Agriculture, would routinely just OK uh, Monsanto and other corporations' applications to expand use of these seeds. And so, for instance, we now see 94% uh, of the soy uh, crops in America are GMO. And it's somewhere between 60 and 75 percent, depending on the crop, for cotton and corn. Uh, last year, the Obama administration gave the OK to expand this into beet, uh, sugar beets and alfalfa. Uh, they have, you know, GMO wheat in the pipeline. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, and part of the reason is just the phenomenal level of corporate power over government policy in the United States, uh, which stems from uh, the fact that these companies have such control over the market. Uh, so, that, so, for instance, Monsanto, um, you know, along with two other companies, controls half of the world's uh, seed supply. So, you know, and then we see it especially powerful in the U.S. with those crops that I just mentioned. I mean, is, and, is Monsanto more powerful than the U.S. government? I'm just curious. No, <laughs> I don't think we should pretend that they are. I don't think I don't think that we need to overly demonize them just to see that what they what they're doing is what any other company would do. And I think we have to be clear about that. You know, this is not just one evil company. The food industry, what the agribusiness industries, frankly, do is they try to turn a profit and they try to become as big as possible and control as much of the market as they can. And once they do, um, their pockets are very deep for controlling politics and to have the wheel regulatory process and so it doesn't seem to matter which political party we have. Both of the President Bush and President Obama have been 
roughly equally friendly uh, to the GMO industry. You know, and the danger is not just, you know, that we don't know what's in our food mm -hmm. and the fact that there are allergens that have been introduced into our food system. It's also, as you mentioned earlier, the control over farmers' ability to survive and to produce the crops they want to produce. And so even if farmers may start off uh, liking, you know, a Monsanto product and they link in with it, um, they're, they're suddenly completely unable to control their fate. And so Monsanto... I mean, it's, it, it, sorry to interrupt you. I mean, it sounds like a drug pusher, essentially. You know, I used the analogy before where, you know, if McDonald's started putting crack in, in their burgers and hooking customers on their specific burgers and then also happened yeah. to sue anyone that went to, you know, Burger King for, for an alternative, I mean, that would be gang drug warfare. Uh, and yet we don't... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, in the first decade of GMOs in the U.S., Monsanto sued over 2,300 farmers claiming that they had uh, stolen their seeds, when in actuality many farmers have found their organic crops or non-GMO crops to be polluted uh, by the seeds blowing through the wind. And yet Monsanto will turn around and sue them anyway, even though these farmers don't want those crops. And, you know, and again, the, the, the very technology of GMOs is very troubling because the whole point of it is to be non-replicating, non-reproducing, so you have to go to the company to get their seeds, and you have to go to the same company for the pesticides mm -hmm. that will be used to eradicate the rest of, of the pests and the other and the weeds and the rest. And and so these crops are not just they're not good for the environment. They're they they enable the use of more pesticides in many cases, and they're also a real threat to both farmers and biodiversity by wiping out and taking over other crops. So it's a and, 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 and Chris, before we run out of time, I'm sorry, I just really, you know, uh, it sounds kind of bad, right? But what what is the actual effect of, of GMO food on, on, on human people? I mean, there's been, I think it was an alternate article that said that Monsanto doesn't even serve its own products uh, in its cafeteria. I don't know how true that is, but uh, should the average American be concerned about health effects from GMOs? Well, absolutely. I mean, the studies are still being done, but there are a number of studies showing, again, that they introduce, by crossing different seeds, they introduce allergens into the food supply, and some people are very allergic to certain things. And when you don't label, uh, you know, it's not enough to just say it's GMO. Well, what, what was the, uh, the thing space allergic just into this food that never had that before? So that's just one example of the hazard. You know, the rest... You know, again, there's a lot of scientific uh, study being done, both on the biodiversity and environment side, so a stop to this, and certainly labeling at the very least, but even that's not enough, because we still won't know what's in our... Well, it seems like uh, a battle of uh, the American people versus uh, Goliath, although I don't really know if it's uh, the political system or, or the companies or, or who's really the Goliath in this case. But uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. That was Christopher D. Cook, the author of the book Diet for a Dead Planet.